Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Thursday, July 9th, 2015. Here's a quick look what's coming up. Tonight. Ideologies are not defeated with guns. They're defeated by better ideas. The White House says guns won't defeat ISIS as the Pentagon spends millions to train moderate rebels. Then... Stuart Rhodes of Oath Keepers has a dire warning for America. And how might your life be different if you weren't white? When you say white, what does that mean to you? MTV takes a break from normalizing teen pregnancy to make white youth feel very uncomfortable. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. This is the opposite of the culture Martin Luther King talked about. This is where everything is you have guilt because you're white and you're inherently bad. Pure racism. While the U.S. government and the mainstream propaganda machine continue to insist that ISIS is a independent homegrown entity that was hatched out of the Middle East by radical Muslim extremists, well, it turns out that that isn't exactly accurate at all. In fact, now we have plenty of evidence that suggests that ISIS is a U.S. CIA manufactured Frankenstein. And any investigative journalist out there with any decency or any media organization with real integrity, well, they would tell you just that. ISIS and Al-Qaeda they are both created to destabilize a strategically and vitally important Middle East. Now, you have to understand that these are pieces on the grand chessboard designated for U.S. imperial control. The purpose of ISIS is simple. If you want to take over another country like Iraq, Libya, or Syria, then you send in a bunch of bad guys to rape and pillage the nation create total chaos, move the countries into civil war, and then you go in there and you divide and conquer. A seven hour long debate in the British Parliament has culminated in a landslide approval of UK strikes on Islamic State positions in Iraq. All three major parties backing the initiative the bombings could be unleashed any moment now. Breaking tonight, a troubling report on the terror group now in control of a third of Iraq. The State Department is now pulling hundreds of staffers from the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad as this terror group controls more of the territory around the capital city. Fox News alert the town of al-Baghdadi falling into the hands of ISIS as the Iraqi army evaporates. This as the terror group gains ground in Anbar province, some predicting a collapse of the area within hours. ISIS is also fighting to keep territory in Iraq. Tonight, a fierce battle continues for Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit. As of today, there's a new battle that has begun against ISIS trying to recapture Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit. In a new, slickly produced video, ISIS claims its militants are still on the streets of Tikrit, confidently fighting off the assault by Iraqi forces. On the global map, you see ISIS spreading the places like Algeria and Libya uh, into the Far East and Indonesia and the Philippines as well. Islamic State terror group has reportedly executed a hundred of its own foreign fighters who tried to flee their headquarters in the Syrian city of Raqqa. Can ISIS be defeated in this battle here? That's the big question mark. And if ISIS can't be defeated, having taken this fight now to back to ISIS and if the Iraqi military is unsuccessful, then I think you have to look at a very different map in the Middle East. We're here in the 17th Division military base just outside the city of Arraqqa. And we're here with the soldiers of Bashar. You can see them now digging their own graves in the very place where they were stationed. The very place where they were stationed terrorizing the Muslims in Raqqa. Alhamdulillah, the hukum of Allah is going to be carried out on these same soldiers by the, by the brothers from the Muhajirin and Ansar that captured them. And behind them, you can see the officer's residence filled with bullet holes and artillery shells from the Islamic State. This is the end of every Nusayri Kafir that we get a hold of. This is the end that they face. Walhamdulillah wal lil mu'mineen.
Now, it was very important to understand where these monsters came from, who's really controlling ISIS and who's pulling the strings. For example, I mean, do you honestly really believe that all those U.S. weapons drops that accidentally got in the hands of ISIS, do you think that that was really a mistake? Come on, man. I mean, the U.S. government is supporting these guys. U.S. intelligence, along with their partners in crime over there in Saudi Arabia, now even Turkey, well, they helped create, arm, train, and fund radical Muslim extremists like ISIS and al-Qaeda, or better known around here as al-Qaeda. Now, Obama, the Pentagon, and Congress, they're going to tell you that the hundreds of millions of dollars they are spending to overthrow President Bashir al-Assad in Syria, that all that money is going to what they call moderate rebels. So they're giving that money to moderate terrorists. But we know better than that. I mean, we've got proof from multiple sources that these moderates are really violent Muslim extremists trained and supported by the U.S. and our allies. For example, we now have a declassified secret U.S. government document that was obtained by Judicial Watch through the Freedom of Information Act that says... Western governments deliberately allied with al-Qaeda and other Islamic extremists to overthrow Syrian President Bashir al-Assad. It goes on to say that the Pentagon foresaw the likely rise of the Islamic State as a direct consequence of the strategy, but they armed these guys anyway. So it was either totally irresponsible or deliberate. Either way, the U.S. government is responsible in arming terrorist organizations all throughout the region. And there was even another batch of documents, of, again, obtained by Judicial Watch through a federal lawsuit. This time, secret DIA documents from 2012, where it looks like the U.S. intelligence community was predicting the rise of ISIS through their own internal documents. Wow. I mean, this is bombshell. And you're not going to hear about this on the mainstream news media because, well, the truth will not be televised. But check this out. I mean, just because the mainstream media is ignoring all this, that doesn't mean everyone else is. I mean, if you look around throughout the world, these secret declassified documents, they're getting a lot of attention right now. And that means right here in America as well, through social media and independent media as well. Now, I don't know if you know, if, if you don't know who this is, you should know who Daniel Ellsberg is. He is the legendary whistleblower who leaked the Pentagon Papers, exposing White House lies about the Vietnam War. President Nixon at the time called him the most dangerous man in America. They even made a really good documentary with the same title, Most Dangerous Man in America. Daniel Ellsberg, He's been in all kinds of documentaries. They've made films about him. This guy is the real deal. He was a U.S. military analyst who worked at the Pentagon, and he exposed Nixon for the fraud that he really was. And now, Daniel Ellsberg, he's talking about these recent DIA documents. Now, he says that they provide compelling evidence that the Western government's strategy on Syria created ISIS. So it's a big deal. He said they were directly supporting the extremist groups, and they were predicting that this support would result in an Islamic State organization, an ISIS or ISIL. They were encouraging it, regarding it as a positive development. The DIA report is extremely significant. Well, you could say that again. And like I said, Ellsberg is not alone. Lots of people are coming forward right now and talking about this. And you really need to check out the article that's posted right now on Zero Hedge. It goes into great detail about the documents obtained by Judicial Watch. The article is called, Ex-U.S. Intelligence Officials Confirm Secret Pentagon Report Proves U.S. Complicity in the Creation of ISIS. So this is no longer speculation or a conspiracy theory. This is a documented fact. The people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. Yeah, that was then, this is now. I guess some things never change. After all, I mean, the United States government, the CIA and the military industrial complex, they've been playing this game for a very long time. 
It's a game called Divide and Conquer. What they do is they go in there, they destabilize a region by starting a civil war, then they send in radical terrorists to do our dirty work. It's just absolute brainwashing with a public that doesn't even know who the players are. Al-Qaeda in Iraq four years ago was allowed to set up bases in the west of Iraq and invade eastern Syria. They started the civil war four years ago in Syria. They were given massive funding. They're 65 percent, according to NATO, of the rebel force. The Council on Foreign Relations last year had the headline, Why We Need Al-Qaeda. And they said, give them air support to take over the country and we'll remove them later. Bull. Not only are we getting new reports that this group may have executed as many as 1,700 Iraqi security forces in recent days, including in a massacre that, that they put online and bragged about, but today we learned that the same group may now be in possession of a deadly cache of American-made firepower, Stinger missiles. They are powerful enough to take down a commercial airliner. That's right. American Stinger missiles now in the hands of terrorists. Now, what do you think is going to happen if one of these Stinger missiles takes out a U.S. helicopter full of U.S. troops or, God forbid, a passenger airliner or an ISIS terror attack right here in the United States? Who do you think they're going to blame then? Well, if you're New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, that's easy. You blame Rand Paul. People are really worried about ISIS. They're really worried about the threat of terrorism. And that's why what Rand Paul has done to make this country weaker and more vulnerable is a terrible thing. You know, what he's done is we're going to look back on this. I listen this morning. We're going to look back on this. And he should be in front of hearings in front of Congress if there's another attack, not the director of the FBI or the director of the CIA. I mean, really, Governor Christie? Come on, man. I mean, that's pretty ridiculous if you ask me. And, and Rand Paul, he thought so, too. His response to the criticism was saying that he thinks that Governor Christie is totally out of touch with the American public. Yeah, you think? I mean, check out this baseball uniform. Need I say more? My God, man. I mean, what was he thinking? Did he look in the mirror? I can hear Jennings in my ear right now saying, why are you making us look at this? <laughs> but look, you know, I could care less about Governor Christie's appearance, because it's not about that. It's about what he's saying about Rand Paul. And if there's indeed ISIS terror cells right here in the United States, and if they do strike, it's not because Rand Paul is weak on defense or is weak on our national security. It's not about that. No, it's about dumbasses like Governor Christie or the neocons, or the Obama administration that armed, funded, and trained these ISIS terrorists to begin with. I can't see fighting to impose Sharia law in, in Syria. I also can't see sending my son to fight with Islamic rebels against Christians. I also can't see my son going to fight with Al, on the same side as Al-Qaeda. There are so many ironies and unfortunate muddling nature to this that I can't see why we should get involved, and mm -hmm. there are potential repercussions. Oh, if he, but I am proposing that you will be giving arms to the side that is fighting against Assad that has elements of Al-Qaeda. There is a great irony there. I am also saying that in your rush to get involved in Syria, that you may well be arming Islamic rebels who will be shooting Christians. It's hard to argue that the Syrian rebels that you will be arming are not associated forces of al-Qaeda. Are they not fighting on the same side of a war? Can you argue there's no connection between them, that really this is a three-way war? I know that's the way we're trying to break it down. I don't think it's that easy to say that. I think it's impossible to say that the Syrian rebels are not associated with al-Qaeda. So there is a great irony that you will be arming forces that a, a normal common sense use of the word associated can say that these people are associated with al-Qaeda. That's all. Thank you. Is the U.S. involved with any uh, procuring of weapons, transfer of weapons, buying, selling, anyhow transferring weapons to Turkey out of Libya? To Turkey? From Turkey? I mean, what on earth gave you that idea? There goes Rand, talking crazy again. Our so-called allies of Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Qatar are publicly funding these proxy armies 
to take out all of their enemies and run around chopping off every Christian head they find and blowing up every non-radical mosque and every Shiite mosque they find. Saudi Arabia is the homeland of radical Islam, and it's allied with our criminal rogue government. It ran the attacks of 9-11, working with criminals in our government, to take American freedom and attack their arch enemy at the time, Iraq, who was blamed when Saddam gave speeches saying, I'm arch enemies with Al-Qaeda, they're always trying to kill me, they work for Saudi Arabia, I've been set up, I worked with your government, I was trained in Egypt by the CIA, I was told to attack Iran, I have been set up. Saddam gave all those speeches, they were true. Does it mean Saddam was an angel cake? Does it mean Hazi Mubarak was an angel? No, but they were Western dictators who did not persecute at one one hundredth that Al Qaeda does. But they had made for TV movies and HBO movies and all about how bad Saddam was. Saddam could go stand in a crowd of 20,000 people with AK 47s and no one was shooting. Under Saddam Hussein, they had total Second Amendment rights. Now, Iraq's being broken in three parts. And our president has the nerve to come out and say, we need to beat Al-Qaeda, because that's what ISIS is, and ISIL, with ideas when he knows full well they're funding them and it's a proxy army. The whole Pentagon knows, the whole military knows, and the good news is they've spoken out against it. You've, had, you've seen hearings, but they've successfully contained all that now and shut down a debate about it. We have to force that debate back out in the open. Presidential candidate Donald Trump has been suffering a lot of political backlash for daring to exercise his freedom of speech. But now they're hitting him where it hurts, his pocketbook. He has lost tens of millions of dollars in response to his politically incorrect comments about illegal immigration, even though they might be factually correct. And that's why some people are rallying behind Trump, agreeing with his comments. Thousands of people who've been murdered by illegal aliens and raped and child molesters and drunk drivers. So Donald Trump was right on. I mean, in our community, what we call the death community, Donald Trump is like speaking for us, speaking for our dead. And we all know that the establishment media is notorious for ignoring important political issues by concentrating on individual takedowns. We are taking Mexico's problems. Mexico is beating us on trade and they're beating us at the border. But Mexico doesn't want to take these people, so what do they do? They send them to our stupid politicians, and we have sanctuary cities, and we have all of this nonsense. I've been saying this for a long time, Katie, and it's a disgrace. And frankly, if I didn't bring it up, you wouldn't even be talking about immigration right now. Illegal immigration is an issue for the United States. According to new data from the U.S. Sentencing Commission, illegal aliens were responsible for three fourths of federal drug sentences in 2014. They also made up more than one third of all federal sentences. The establishment media would also like you to forget that some pretty powerful Democrats used to agree with Trump. If making it easy to be an illegal alien isn't enough, how about offering a reward for being an illegal immigrant? No sane country would do that, right? Guess again, if you break our laws, by entering this country without permission and give birth to a child, we reward that child with U.S. citizenship and guarantee of full access to all public and social services this society provides. And that's a lot of services. Is it any wonder that two-thirds of the babies born at taxpayer expense at country county-run hospitals in Los Angeles are born to illegal alien mothers? That was 1993, Harry Reid, introducing his bill, the Immigration Stabilization Act of 1993. In a press release unveiling the bill, Reid noted, Our borders have overflowed with illegal immigrants, placing tremendous burdens on our criminal justice system, schools, and social programs. Our federal wallet is stretched to the limit by illegal aliens getting welfare, food stamps, medical care, and other benefits, often without paying any taxes. Safeguards like these are in place to boost Americans in need of short-term assistance. These programs were not meant to entice freeloaders and scam artists from around the world. Even worse, Americans have seen heinous crimes committed by individuals who are here illegally. Where is the media witch hunt? But he's not the only flip-flopper. 
And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. I made this exception basically on humanitarian grounds because of the individual stories. But certainly we've got to do more at our borders and people have to stop employing illegal immigrants. So what happened to change their tune? Did their hearts suddenly grow three sizes? Or could it be that the number of Latino voters in this country has increased by 300 percent in the last 30 years? And that number is only climbing. That's what this is really about. Last June, University of California professor Daryl Y. Hamamato told InfoWars that he sees a clear plan to destroy national sovereignty through mass, uncontrolled, illegal immigration. The current influx of illegal immigrants into the United States is part of a plan to create a new underclass of people who can be re-educated in order to create a subservient underclass. This is the so-called Cloward and Piven strategy at work, folks. The strategy here is very simple. You flood the welfare state with needy people until it reaches its breaking point. So then the people have no choice but to accept Marxism as a substitute. And the global elite are going to exploit this new privileged class of people to take down America and turn it into a third world cesspool. All right, we're going to cut this segment short because I understand we have an urgent phone call right now from Admiral Akbar of the Rebel Alliance. Admiral, thanks for joining us. You know, we were just talking about the internet kill switch and Barack Obama, you know, he just said that he thinks we should hand power of the internet over to the federal government. I think that sounds like a scary thought. And Obama says it will be used fairly and distributed equally. What do you say to that? It's a trap. What happened? Do we just, do we lose them? Jakari Jackson here with some of the most bizarre news concerning political correctness and it's going right into your children's schools. Now before I get into some of the more recent news, I want to do a, a throwback article here. Girls threatened with hate crime charges for complaining about transgender bathroom harassment. So basically a person, I guess he doesn't want to be called a young man, decided that he wants to go use the girls' bathroom because he identifies as transgender. This is something that happened in Colorado back in 2013. And the girls were saying, hey, I don't feel comfortable using the bathroom when there's a dude in here. And the school sided with the transgendered, not the young ladies. So the girls were being threatened saying, hey, you're uh, being discriminatory to this man because, or to this person, he doesn't want to be called a man because you're not allowing him free access to the ladies room and you have complaints about that. And um, it just gets more bizarre from that. That was 2013 and we have an article came out today, Oregon allowing 15 year olds to get state subsidized sex change operations. And uh, you can't get <laughs> too much more blunt than that. So we went from 2013 having people being able to use whatever bathrooms to now 2015 and people can go and get a state subsidized sex change. It's very bizarre indeed. And I do understand you, you go to some place like an airport or a hospital. Sometimes they have the family bathrooms where you can go in there, whether you're a man or a woman, or they have the unisex bathrooms. We can go in whether you're a man or a woman, but those are usually, you know, one use facilities. You know, it's just a one person dwelling for that time, it's not something where they have everybody running through there. So instances like that, you know, I think a transgendered person or whatever the politically correct term may be can use a facility like that. But, you know, a men's room is for men. It says right on the door as is the ladies room is for the ladies. It says that on the door as well. But going deeper into the school system, this is by far probably the weirdest thing I've heard. Nebraska school bans term boys and girls and trains teachers to avoid gender expressions. So basically, in this all-inclusive society, 
They are telling the teachers not to use phrases like boys and girls, you guys, ladies and gentlemen, and instead use things such as campers, readers, athletes, or even purple penguins. I'm not making this up. They are telling the teachers to refer to the students as purple penguins. More reports on Infowars.com. So again, I just reiterate that we promptly responded to the requests and there was no response whatsoever from prior counsel to that objection. Prior counsel never ever responded. Commissioners, I'm going to be out of order. Yes. Objection. Well, objection. I know, but he's, he's lying. lying. You don't have a right. He's, he's, he's you're lying. Right he's actually, he actually is the I'm the complainant. The complainant. That man is you lying. Don't, you don't have a right to speak. You can come forward. Never have met a liar like this man this here. I'll tell you what, we're talking about children safe. I was threatened by the mafia in Connecticut for challenging Sandy Hook. Yeah. I will be going right. to the FBI. I, I am going to uh, uh, move to uphold uh, or approve the amended uh, decision. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Hey, Attorney Frank, are you satisfied with the decision? Mr. Frank, are you satisfied with the decision? Of course, he's not going to answer. I have never witnessed, never witnessed grown men who are appointed by the governor act in such a manner. And to have an attorney, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I've worked with a lot of attorneys all my life as an expert witness. That is a disgraceful man. To lie the way he did, I mean, I am, I am totally amazed that these these grown men in there can't see the lies. Now that's what the sad part of this is. Now tell us what the decision was and what it means. That's Kay's job. <laughs> Basically they did adopt the proposed decisions that have been issued before and what that means is that uh, you know they basically dismissed one of our FOIA requests or our appeals outright and in the other one they basically said that we got everything but that it wasn't timely and therefore their order was that the uh, town of Newtown, the respondents, ought to comply more quickly in the future, and that was it. That's just a slap on the hand. And do you believe you were given all the documents in your request? I don't believe that we were given the true and accurate copies of certain documents, and that's what I argued today. Um, and and, and the point that she really tried to make to these commissioners, these are adults. These are people who work in our communities. When she was trying to make the point, we had 911 calls coming in, four of them, in a matter of seven minutes, and every one of them screaming, shots fired, shots fired, and they send out the call as a trespasser, and it's not reported in the official documents? How is that even possible? These people are falsifying official documents shots fired and it's a trespasser nowhere nowhere on the call for service or in the incident log do you see shots ever fired who what police department in this country sends out 22 police units for a trespasser i want to know that and um what questions do you now have for the city of newtown connecticut there's going to be a lot of questions and again kay and i are going to meet we're going to talk about it and i think actually don't be disappointed. I want to tell everybody here listening, and Infowars, John B. Wells, let me tell you, you people have been there, all those that donated. This is just the beginning. They have taught us how to play the game. Now we're going to play the game better. We're going to cross our T's and dot our I's, but guess what? We're going to be back in that room, and I'm okay. we're going to be stronger than ever. We're going to do it right so the Monty Franks can't call us a liar and tell us that we're not doing our job. Now, what were the biggest smoking guns you noticed in the last two hearings in this one? Well, the big smoking guns, are you ready for this? How in the world does an attorney for the other side tell our witnesses not to show up? How does an attorney direct our key witnesses, Kevin Ancelotti, Kathy Gombos, who is the pre they have the information and they're directed not to come to testify? That's our witnesses. And they say it's all right. And then, are you ready to say it? I heard somebody say in there that the commission can issue subpoenas. Oh, they can. 
Yeah, but it's right on the statute. What did Tom Budson say? It's right in the statute. What did Tom Thomas Hennig say? Well, when I did did speak to the ombudsman, he basically indicated that as a practice, as a practice, the commission does not issue subpoenas. So it's a circle. You're in a circular loop. So anybody who practices in this area, which Attorney Frank does, knows full well that if you tell witnesses not to appear, then I have to go, then we would have to go to the Superior Court. And the Superior Court from the case law typically tells people, no, no, go to the commission. And so I went to the commission and they said they wouldn't issue them because they don't do that as a practice. So it's, it's a real catch-22. Now, what are your thoughts on the last hearing, um, hours before Chief Michael Kehoe resigned from the new Newtown Police Department as chief? It's not important, to be honest with you. It doesn't matter. You know, I expect people like that who lie, they run. You know, eventually they got to go somewhere else because they can only lie so long. Here's a question I have for everybody who's listening. Where are the 26 kids from the S Super Bowl? Where did they go? What are their names? Why were they given a gag order by the NFL and CBS Sports never to talk about what they saw at the Super Bowl? Who gives little children a gag order? But yet at Newtown, the day of the shooting, supposedly, they had every little kid in front of a camera talking about how the bullets was by their head. But the kids at Super Bowl can't talk. Now, how is that possible? And um, you want to tell the folks out there how they could donate? Because, folks, it costs a lot of money just to subpoena people. Just for them to fly up here from Florida, it costs a lot of money. So you want to tell the uh, people out there how they could donate toward your cause? Well, let me tell you something. First of all, Kay and I would not be here today unless it was for the donors. We could not be doing this. And we appreciate your support. We will not forget you. And every donor is going to get a transcript, copy of our transcript, so they can see the lies that we're seeing. But again, read it, look at it, and even teach us what we need to do better. But if you want to help, you want to donate, look in your heart, okay? It's going to go pay for legal bills. We're going to fight this battle. We're not going away. But go to www.sandyhookjustice.com, and we're going to be there. If we allow government to control what happens in our schools, if we allow government to create panic and fear, and then affect the emotions of adults all across the country by, you know, putting on this huge illusion, we're in serious trouble. This government is doing whatever they want, and we're buying it because we're watching this stupid national news. And they're, they're hurting us right now. I'm doing this for the parents. I'm doing this for the grandchildren. I got three of them. And I promise you this, we deserve better. We deserve better what we saw in here today. And Kay Wilson, let me tell you what, she, hey, she did exactly what she's supposed to do. She pitched it, but they didn't get it. You know why? They didn't want to get it. They already had their minds made up. Once again, I have to use the word unbelievable for the third time here. But regardless, it shows one thing, that resistance is victory. Because regardless of what happened here, folks, people are now awake about Sandy Hook and everything else going on. So, folks, again, you are the resistance. Dan Bedondi, Infowars.com. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now, just moments ago, I had the opportunity to speak with a very concerned mother, Jessica Bianchi. Now, she took her two children, a boy and a girl, the girl's about eight years old, to the doctor for a normal routine visit. And some of the questions that were asked of her children were quite concerning. Now, just so a lot of you don't think that I'm pulling your leg, I want to give you a couple references of things that have happened that have been in mainstream news about transgender roles with children, things like that, the way that our current society is kind of pushing that on these young children. Now, this is an article from Washington Times, Children's Hospital Opens Clinic for Transgender Children. This is out of Dallas AP. And then also we have out of CBN News, gender identity curriculum angers parents in Virginia. So this is something that is happening in and around our country as we speak right now. And also we have a Bloomberg article, California lets grade schoolers decide gender identity. What kind of kid is able to make a decision like that? at such a young age. Their minds are still being molded at this point in time. From National Review, school told to call kids purple penguins because boys and girls is not inclusive to transgender. These are dark times that we are living in now. The fact that this is the kind of stuff that is being pushed on our children. 
Now we're going to go to my interview with Jessica Bianchi and let her tell her side of the story. All right, thanks. Now we're going to interview Jessica Bianchi. Now, she is a mother who just recently took her kids to the doctor. Now, Jessica, tell us what happened the other day. Well, I was taking my two kids in. I have a son, Nathan, who is six, and a daughter, Kayla, who's just about to be eight. And this was just kind of a routine annual checkup. Um, called ahead to make sure there was no shots, so it was pretty. It wasn't going to be any surprises or anything like that. And we got there, and... You know, they started doing the routine things and asking some questions like, you know, are your kids getting fruits and vegetables every day? Um, And then they started asking some more kind of alarming questions, one of which was, are your children being properly socialized? Which, of course, sent a huge red flag in my mind. Um, We had a family just one county over from us who had uh, five of their kids taken away for, quote, not being properly socialized. So that wording specifically was like, wait a minute, they've never asked me this before. Um, and then they also asked things like, what kind of extracurricular activities are your kids in? But to the point where it was like, if you didn't tell them something, it was like, it wasn't the right answer. Like they're like, well, they're in something, right? What are they in? Oh, what they're in at church. We'll let that count for you. Um, like, like they had to mark down that the child was involved in something extracurricular or it was negative. Then they asked me, do you have any guns in your house? So that that was pretty alarming to me, you know, thinking, what what business do you have even knowing that, you know? Yeah, that's your right to protect your family if you do have a gun or not. So um, that's none of their business. And, uh, exactly. Exactly. And and two, it, all these questions were just kind of um, they they were presented in a way that was very much put me in a position where I felt like I was being interrogated. Um which is not at all what you expect when you go to the doctor. And this is a doctor that my family's been going to for close to five years now. So um, I really didn't expect any surprises. You know, I've been sharing this story with friends just to kind of give them a heads up. And they've been like, oh, well, you need a new doctor and this and that. And I said, well, this is, this was our doctor for this long. It's not like we tried a new, you know, just had a bad experience. And then, you know, they, they moved move on with the exam. And I think, okay, that's over. This is crazy. I'm going to have to look into this. And my doctor, my doctor comes in. That was the nurse asking us those questions. The doctor comes in and, you know, does the kind of normal routine, checks the kids. Um, and my daughter who remember, she's almost eight now. He asked her, are you a boy or a girl? Wow. Excuse me. Yeah. I think I would be, uh, what right do you have asking my child that? I was just, I was floored. I just, I mean, I, I felt like in shock. It was, it was weird because you think of people being in shock and like car accidents and things like that. But I just sat there like in shock, like this cannot be happening. Like, you know, and then he goes, what about your brother? Is he a boy or a girl? What about your mommy? And she's wearing a dress to the doctor's appointment. He goes, what about you? Do you wear dresses? What about your brother? Does he ever wear dresses? Wow. And that's out of control. Um, it is so out of control and it's all over the news. It's not like he can even pretend like this is something that he had no idea about. You know, we've got these little kids that are four that parents are condoning their choice to be a different gender. It's like, would you do that if they said, I want to be a unicorn? Um, but we confronted our doctor on this. My husband did. There's actually like a web portal that you can go to and put in messages and things like that to communicate with your doctor. And he had messaged him saying, you know, my daughter told me that you had asked this question if she was a boy or a girl. I do not think that is appropriate at all. What would ever give you the idea that that was an OK question? And the doctor's response to this really, really just got me upset because his response was, I ask silly questions to build rapport with my patients. Yeah. Like he asked that at the beginning of the doctor's meeting instead of the end. 
Well, he, yeah, well, he asked it, you know, if you're building a rapport, you're going to, yeah, exactly. Do that at at the beginning of a doctor's office, right? You're going to build a rapport up that way. They don't feel as funny when you're asking them to stick out their tongue and put things in their ears and whatnot. But he asked it at dead last at the very, very end. And it was really bizarre because he asked it almost in a way where it was like he, he didn't want to ask it, ask it, but he had to get through it. And after the fact, he was really reassuring, like, your kids are good. Your kids are good. Your kids are good. Um, you have healthy kids. Don't worry about anything. So um, he, you know, his response was just, oh, it was a silly question. I also did speak with the office manager at the doctor's office. And her response to me was, we ask all the kids that. And I, I confronted her on that. And I said, no, you don't. We've been there for five years. And we've never been asked that questions before. And I said, is this something new that is a requirement in your offices. And she said, Oh, I wouldn't know anything about that. I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure all the doctors ask that question. So, I mean, as a parent, it's really upsetting to not only have an experience like that, but you can't even get to the bottom of why it's going on because all you're getting is lies left and right. So, yeah, this is probably a new part of the uh, Obamacare some of these questions are rolling out some of the typical stuff that they ask veterans as well. Do you have guns or not? And then they come in and, you know, kick them off their health care and this and that. Right. So, th I mean, it's amazing the way that they're pushing this whole transgender lifestyle, especially at such a young age. Now, you know, they have these MTV shows, yeah. all these different things. And it's good to see that you're coming out, you're telling the story and kind of helping inform a lot of these other parents so they can look for these signs when they go to the doctor as well. Yes, definitely. It's I've the biggest takeaway I've gotten from this, honestly, is just you never know where this is going to come from. You never know we're going to have someone breach your rights as a parent. And so now more than ever, we just have to really be on, on guard and on the look at look out every possible place, even the places that for us used to be safe havens, which is really scary. And you're also telling me, too, that there was another family who homeschooled their children and they had their kids taken as well, right? Yeah, um, some some friends that are, are homeschoolers, uh, they actually had a friend of theirs. Um, pretty much, they were dropping off some food at their house, and this this friend from church, none, nonetheless, who was dropping off food at their house, saw that the house was messy. Which, of course, it would be messy. Moms in the hospital. We know the moms are doing a, a lot of the cleaning. So, mom was in the hospital, and the older kids um, were keeping, you know, an eye on the little ones. And dad was at work, and he was going to be home later that evening. And that woman just didn't like. You know, that wasn't her idea of what should be ha happening. And so instead of going to the parent, um, she went right to CPS and CPS was able to get a judge to sign off, sign off on an immediate evacuation of all of those children. It's and amazing the world we live in where so sad. <laughs> people just go in and do these things. I mean, left and right, we're seeing homeschoolers being attacked. We're seeing yeah. these kids being asked these crazy questions. And this is just the world that we're living in now. But the best, we, best thing that we can do is inform one another and help each other fight this stuff with information. So I just want to say thank you, Jessica, for uh, taking yes. time out of your morning to come out here and talk to us and share your story. Thank you, Joe. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. You too. In the past decade, we have witnessed unparalleled scientific discoveries in the area of health. But no one has put together a formula that focuses directly on brain health, nerve growth factors, and optimizing your cellular energy at the same time. DNA Force is one of the most expensive formulas to produce. Some of the ingredients in DNA Force are $12,000 a kilogram. We are using the coveted, patented, only American source of PQQ, CoQ10, and more. You want the best that's out there at the lowest price anywhere? Well, we're bringing you a total win-win. The ultimate value, cutting-edge, trailblazing game changer that also supports the info war. We have produced a limited run of DNA Force, and it will take up to 12 weeks to produce more once we sell out. Secure your DNA force today at InfoWarsLife.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. DNA force from InfoWars Life.
the knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. We celebrate the 4th of July as a reminder of earning our independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government. Just a reminder to the Obama administration, there's plenty of room on the calendar for another holiday. at this time a very well orchestrated attempt to divide and conquer the American people along racial lines, along class lines. It is a fourth generation warfare, full scale assault on this country and our institutions. It is not just military, it is that also. It's also political, it's economic, it's social, it's psychological, it's in the media, it's in the courts, you name it full frontal assault. And the greatest weapon right now they have is to divide and conquer us. You can see it in effect right now. Obama is not a, a unifier. He's the most divisive president this country has ever seen. And he's doing it intentionally. He would love nothing better than see a race war. He would love to see that. And that's what I think he's trying to do, which is exactly why we went and guarded shops in Ferguson. And that was Stuart Rhodes, the founder and director of Oath Keepers, calling for an emergency summit in preparation for the coming economic collapse. Now, Stuart, you said that we are in a perfect storm right now and we can expect a nationwide Katrina. And I wanted to get your thoughts on what you think, what's going to happen to the average American citizen during an economic collapse? Well, the same thing that happened to the folks in New Orleans who were also unprepared except worse, because now, how do you send relief from outside when the entire country is under the same circumstances? And so, you know, people would be desperate and hungry and, and open to being preyed upon by, by both public and private criminals. And so the only way to, to stop that and to throw a monkey ranch into it is to make sure that we can feed our own people. We need a grain reserve like we used to have during the Cold War. That's why I encourage our guys to do these, stu these summits in every state, bring together all the veterans and all the patriots, whether they're veterans or not, all this together, bring them together and get them organized into geographic teams of each corner of the state, each quadrant, to go back to their communities and get prepared. And number one is going to have to be that food reserve. If you don't have food, you're dead. Well, that's right. And, and the federal government, it's not like they're going to help us. I mean, I don't see them stockpiling massive amounts of food and water and, and medicine. But on the other hand, they are definitely stockpiling massive amounts of weapons and ammunition, not to mention militarizing the nation's police force, which right now it resembles a, a, a standing army, you know? And so to me, it looks like they're digging in and that they are preparing for martial law or, or perhaps even civil war. Oh, well, absolutely. All the indicators are preparation for control um, and suppression of an insurrection, not preparation to feed you. That's why I think that, that this should be no surprise. Food has been used, like a denial of food has been used as a weapon throughout history. I think it's part of their battle plan. They're shaping the future battle space. That's what we're doing too. Whether we're doing it right or wrong, you know, effectively for us or not, is the question. They are making it as effective for them as possible. So I think the great weakness they have is that if we can feed ourselves, now what are they going to do? They can't starve us out. And if we're organized in, in mutual security as well, we have a much better chance. So that's the number one thing we must do, is come together to provide food and security for our, for our fellow Americans in our own communities. Well, absolutely. And, and I also wanted to get your take on the border situation right now, because it seems like the borders are wide open. We here at InfoWars, we talked to Texas border volunteers. They told us some very scary 
stories about how they're, they're finding Muslim prayer rugs on the U.S.-Texas side of the border, Iranian cash, Arabic to English translation books. So there's no doubt that the borders are wide open. Do you think that there's active ISIS cells right now, currently right here in the United States? Oh, we know there are. It's been confirmed. Yeah. We know they're across the border in Mexico. And you can basically look at it like a staging. They've staged their people um, right across the border. They've got advanced teams already inside the United States. They have training camps in Texas. And so now they're just waiting for the signal. And I think that's part of the plan. And the fact that they're not being stopped by the U.S. government uh, let's you know exactly what the agenda is of the, the folks in charge right now. They want that to happen. They're not incompetent. This is part of their plan. Well, I agree. And, and we both know that the, the U.S. government, the CIA, and the military industrial complex, they have a long history of destabilizing other countries, overthrowing other countries. They've been doing this for a long time. They're doing it right now through proxy wars in you know, Libya, Syria, Iraq. And it, to me, it looks like it's the same game plan. They're doing it right here yeah. in the United States. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. And I think you folks in Texas are at the epicenter. You're, you're at the epicenter for Jade Helm. You're at the epicenter for the border crisis. Um, and that's why we're working on a possible um, border project with Oath Keepers to go and start with Texas and guard the, the uh, private ranchers there who are requesting assistance. So we're working on that right now. We hope we have that lined out for the next month. Um, I think it's incredibly important for us to guard our own borders. If the U.S. government won't do it, then we should do it ourselves. And I don't think you Texans can believe the way. Well, absolutely. And I want to take a look at another clip from the speech you recently made at the emergency summit calling for everyone to, yeah, to basically be prepared. This is a red alert. And ladies and gentlemen, you need to protect yourselves and you need to pre be prepared to protect not only yourselves and your families, but your community. What's your skill set? What's your MOS? What'd you do in the military? What'd you do in the police services? What do you got? Okay, you're in this team. Mil and your police officers and infantry guys over here, logistics guys over here, intelligence, communications, medical, engineering, put them in sub teams inside that geographical quadrant. They are now sub teams inside of that bigger team. Their job now is to hear what the threat is to look at your state and see where your strengths and weaknesses are, to go back to their county with a plan and agenda for what they're gonna do in their own county to get squared away. What's the first thing SF does when they go to a country or to a, to a new area? An assessment, right? Exactly. Do an assessment of New York. Do an assessment of your county. John, you guys, pick one county, do a model assessment of that county. So when you hold this summit, you can hold it up and say, guys, Here's how you do an assessment. Now go back to your county with this template, and you, as that group over there, you get it done. In your region, in your counties, you do your own assessments. And you know what you have to do. You gotta get security, you gotta get food, you gotta get medicine, all the essentials. And when they go back to their counties, what's their number one priority, you think? What is it? Organization. Who do they gotta wake up? The other veterans, the other, gun, the other patriots. And in particular, they got to go grab a hold of those business owners, the guys with money, and shake them down. Okay, Mr. Business Owner, this is going to be gone unless you donate to an emergency food bank for this county or this area to feed us. Because when the collapse comes, like in Argentina or in Germany or wherever else you've seen it throughout the world history, food is the big one. If you don't have food, you're done. This country used to have three years of grain reserve during the Cold War. How much we got now? One day. Zero. Shows you what your great weakness is. You can have guns, you can have men that are willing, but if you're all hungry and your neighbors are starving and your kids are starving, they're gonna beg for martial law. They're gonna beg for it. So you had better be able to feed them. You need food reserves, bulk food. So what's their end game? If they do succeed in, you know, with martial law and then people are, are begging for, for martial law, then what happens? Well, they get scrapping in the Constitution and, and ushering us into a uh, worldwide version of the Federal Reserve and, and a worldwide government. That's their absolute agenda. With the United States as kind of a third world subsidiary. And I think it's something that they've been planning for a very long time. Do you think that this happened just with the Obama administration, or do you think that this is something that's been planned for years and years? 
No, it's a long-term game over multiple, multiple decades and multiple administrations. I mean, the Republicans put in place all the mechanisms that the Democrats then use and turn inward, so that they play, they play it together. John McCain is every bit as much of a traitor as Barack Obama or Eric Holder ever were, if, if in fact, he probably worse, because he put the mechanisms in place. And George Bush and Cheney, along with it, too. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and it was the late George Carlin who said the only country that will ever invade America is America. Stuart Rhodes, thank you for joining us. It's good to have you on our side. Thanks a lot, buddy. Take care. God bless. All right, folks, that's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. The InfoWars Nightly News will return, Lord willing, tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time, Texas time, that is.